My father would probably describe it as the greatest adventure he ever had. And still climbing. Cautiously, they dropped their bombs from 15,000 feet, nearly three miles. As you would expect, some of the bombs fell into the sea. London Sunday newspapers printed prominently the United States State Department... These experiences that Second War and other veterans have resonate not only in their lives, but in the lives of those of us who came after them. My dad, Warren McPherson, was a fourth generation Maritimer, born in McClellan's Brook, Pictou County, Nova Scotia. Grew up on the same farm in McClellan's Brook, uh, where he worked on the farm and in the lumber woods with his father. My father decided to enlist, even though he already was married and had a young child, uh, my older brother. He enlisted in the RCAF. And he had to make a decision. The job of wireless air gunner sounded pretty glamorous to him, so he said, aha, I'll take that one, thank you very much. And so he was sent off to Guelph, and he did a program there, then back to Nova Scotia where he flew out off DeBert. Probably in late 42, they were mobilized and sent across to England on active service. Dad and his crew flew various missions which took them over occupied Europe and maybe even into Germany. And they actually participated in some of those massive bombing runs. One night in March of 1944, they headed out on what Dad described as a milk run. Well, lo and behold, Bad weather and strong winds took them a little bit off their target. And suddenly, the sky lit up around them. They had flown over a heavily fortified German base, and their plane was hit. They were damaged beyond being able to make it back to base, and so the order came through to abandon ship. So they tumbled out of the plane into the dark sky over occupied Europe. Uh, after drifting, through the dark night sky, landing somewhere in Europe, German-occupied terrain. Dad remembered that they had an instruction, and that was that in a situation like this, what you needed to do was haul in your parachute, roll it up tightly, and bury it somewhere so that the people looking around or searching couldn't find it. Dad said the last thing that he was going to do was waste time trying to gather all this uh, silk parachute together. So he said he kind of dragged it in, shoved it under the nearest bush, and took off out of there. And that night, he spent in a haymow somewhere in the back end of a farm nearby. And during the night, he said he could hear motorcycles crisscrossing back and forth. And every once in a while, a loud shout from people who he assumed were searching for these guys who descended in the dark. In the barn, he found an old great coat and a farmer's hat which he borrowed so that he could disguise but keep his uh, Air Force uniform. One of the things that they had been told to do was to find their way south, maybe into Spain. And if he was going to follow that instruction, he knew he had to orient himself and find some way of getting there. In order to get the lay of the land, he should get to the high spot, and he could maybe see what was around. There was a hill in the middle of the town. So over the run of the day, he quietly worked his way up to the top of the hill, and at just about dusk, he found himself leaning against a fence at a, a, a viewpoint, an overlook at the top of the hill. And he wasn't feeling very well. He was tired, he was hungry, he was a bit feverish. He'd been hit a couple of times by flak as he'd been uh, parachuting down. He was injured in both the wrist and the knee. And he was kind of knackered. Guy went by on a bicycle. Dad kind of noticed him, but he didn't want to move or do or say anything. But he noticed the bicycle stopped, and the guy turned around and came back very slowly. And as he went by, he said, Allied? Dad said he kind of froze. <laughs> he thought, well, what choice do I have? I'm about the end of my rope here. And he said, yes, Canadian. And the guy said, hey, well, me too. <laughs> and so uh, after checking with my father, um, 
whether he needed anything, he needed some help, and Dad said he did. This guy said, well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You go down the hill here, follow this main road down, cross two streets, and at the third, turn right. Just walk slowly along, and somebody will contact you. And he left on his bike. So Dad thought, well, here we go. So he walked down the hill, and he crossed one street, then another, and turned right at the next intersection. He was walking along slowly. A door opened, an arm came out and yanked him inside, and the door slammed. And he found himself inside sort of a dank basement with a couple of people. And they spoke to him in heavily accented uh, English, asked him uh, how he was, and if he needed anything. Are you hungry? Would you like a drink? Well, Dad needed both of those things, so they offered him a flag and a beer. Dad said he took that and he drank it back, and it was probably the best drink he'd ever had in his life. Now, whether they'd actually spiked the beer or just because he was so tired and the alcohol content kind of hit him, the next thing he remembered was waking up in a room that he came to figure was probably in a hospital. After a little while, these two guys came in. Well, Dad wasn't sure where he was, who they were, what the responsibility was here. So he gave them name, rank, and serial number. That was it. Not being terribly satisfied with his answers, they went out. Time passed. Same two guys came back and asked him if he could tell them the names of maybe somebody who was on the aircraft with him. So he said, well... Stan Miller was the pilot. Stan Miller happened to be in the same hospital, and they had identified each other. Because he was in the hands of the Belgian underground, within a day or so, my father was moved to the little village of Profondville, where uh, he stayed with uh, a doctor, Emile Mellier, and his wife, Lynette, until October of 1944, after Belgium had been liberated by American forces. It's my belief that my father, like countless others, suffered the devastating effects of what we now call PTSD. Certainly he had nightmares or night terrors that lasted throughout his life. And at one point uh, he drank quite a bit. Uh, that was involved socializing with other Air Force vets at the Air Force Club. This condition was both uh, undiagnosed and untreated, and that formed the environment in which we grew up during the 1940s and 50s. They were all admitted to the Caterpillar Club by the American manufacturer of uh, parachutes, because these were silk parachutes, they worked, they were used, and all these guys joined something called the Caterpillar Club.